Hey everybody, uh, this is Mrs. McDaniels. We're going to be talking about arterial uh, vascular disease. Uh, this will be a quick overview and hopefully prepare you for your test. So really, uh, we're looking at any disease process that's going to affect the arteries. Uh, severity is really going to dis depend on the stage of the disease, the extent, and how fast it develops. Those who have peripheral arterial disease that are not receiving treatment due to the fact that they really don't understand that they have the disease. So some folks for a while go um, on without any symptoms. There's different type of ischemia that can occur. Um, critical versus acute critical uh, usually accounts for one to five percent of the cases. They will experience um, pain at rest have non-healing ulcers and can suffer from gangrene. Those with acute, they'll actually see a sudden decrease in the limb perfusion and it can actually threaten the viability of the limb itself. So from an inside uh, perspective, in terms of viability, threatened, and irreversible damage and grading. Viable, you can see here that we have blockage, but there still is a way for uh, blood to bypass to get to the extremities. Um, here as well, you can see, but it's, um, excuse me, now we're going into threatened, so we see we have blockages from here and here, but we still have um, at least one avenue this here you'll see some narrowing um, with a path through and same here. Uh, irreversible when you start having possible um, loss of limb is going to be where there's a complete blockage. So from a nursing assessment it is vital to be doing uh, your skin assessment, looking at your patient from head to toe visibly, uh, looking at those pedal pulses and things of that sort because you can see how quickly um, the damage from ischemia can occur. This is 0 to 6 hours, 6 to 12, and over 12 hours. Um, like I mentioned in class, if you think about a typical shift um, in the hospital of 12 hours, you can see how quickly somebody can go from reversible to irreversible damage. Diagnostic tests um, with peripheral arterial disease can range everything from arteriograms to an uh, ankle brachial index. And in terms of um, testing purposes, uh, you're not going to be specifically tested on any of these. So some risk factors, um, it's a lot like a lot of the other cardiac diseases, arthrosclerosis of the extremities, 40% of patients with PAD will also have some leg pain. Smoking is going to be a big one and we'll talk more about it in the next slide. Hypertension, obesity, hyperlipidemia, diabetes, and sedentary lifestyle. A lot of these things here can be modifiable uh, through whether it's exercise, diet changes, or the addition of some medications. Things that cannot be modified is gender, ethnicity, and genetics. Biggest modifiable risk factor. Smoking is the biggest modifiable risk factor. Nicotine itself decreases blood flow, and increases the risk of clot for formation by increasing platelet aggregation. It also increases heart rate and blood pressure. Smokers have a four times higher risk of developing pain from arterial disease than do non-smokers. So this is the biggest modifiable risk factor. So the progression of peripheral arterial disease, like I said, most people don't get treatment because they are asymptomatic. Over time, they'll start to have some claudication, where this is what claudication is, is a, a reproducible pain or tightness in the calf or thigh after walking a certain predictable distance. Patient can have rest pain. This is pain that occurs with advanced arthrosclerosis when the limbs are in a supine position. Um, so a lot of times patients will feel this at night time when they're laying down. Tissue damage. This is when not enough oxygen um, can get to the extremities to support tissue, uh, tissue growth, so ulcers can occur.
signs and symptoms, hallmark, uh, pain with activity that improves with rest, and that's known as intermittent claudication. Poor hair growth in the lower extremities, the skin can look shiny. They can have some dependent ruber, um, slow to heal sores on legs, coolness or numbness in the extremities, uh, weakness or weak pulses, and also rest pain. And if a patient is having rest pain, uh, then they probably have significant peripheral arterial um, disease. And when we go back, um, and somebody had asked in class, just to remind you, dependent ruber, um, basically the skin itself has a fiery to dusty red colorization um, of the leg when the person has it in a dependent position, um, but not when it's elevated above the heart. So a lot of times, again, this is going to be another symptom of PAD. So I think I've already said it once, and I've several, said it several times in class, intermittent claudication is not rest pain. It's not the same thing. Rest pain clearly is when you're actually having pain, um, when you're resting in a supine position, intermittent claudication um, happens with activity that can be reproduced. And last time, hopefully, uh, this will sink in and hold true with all of you, that you'll know the difference between rest pain versus claudication. Usually, you feel it in the foot. It can occur when the leg is elevated, usually at night, in a supine position. It's not the same thing as leg cramps and it can go away with the dangling leg or walking. And remember, um, and why is that? Um, when we were talking in class, let's see if I can do this without causing much problem here. Uh, this is an arterial issue, so remember, um, in order to help get blood, the first word or first letter in the word arterial to me kind of looks like legs, and so if somebody has an arterial issue then they should dangle their legs or have them in a dependent position to help with the blood flow using gravity. So again, arterial. So this should completely make sense um, why it goes away when the legs that are dangling are walking. Know your uh, six P's, polar, um, so basically cold, paler, pain, pulseless, um, paralysis and paresthesis. Modifications, dash diet, low sodium, low fat, no alcohol or caffeine, stop smoking. I think this is going to be the major trend across um, all of our cardiac issues. Routine exercise, minimum of three times a week, start slow and take breaks, promote vasodilation, um, warm temperatures, because again, if somebody has a blockage, the last thing you want is to do things that are going to vasoconstrict. So that's why smoking sensation um, is important. But you want to suggest the patient to warm temps, warm blankets, offer socks. Do not apply direct heat, just because some patients may have decreased sensitivity. Try to avoid stress, cold, and nicotine. So you can imagine uh, these individuals probably have a tough time in winter. Positioning, avoid crossing legs. Again, it's all about uh, help keeping those arteries open as much as possible. Do not wear restrictive garments, dependent position. Um, so pain improves. Again, remember that whole arterial thing dependent um, to help with the blood flow. There's our arterial. So Patient will see some paler when raising, dependent ruber when lowering. So pharmaceutical uh, management, we have antlet platelets, uh, aspirin, and clopidogrel. Clop, clopidogrel. Clopidogrel. You know, you know, folks, I really just kind of stink at saying some of these names. Um, basically, antiplatelets are going to help make the 
blood less sticky and keep the platelets from clumping together, which ends up being a problem with patients with arthrosclerosis because sometimes um, platelets will start to aggregate around areas where there's a lot of that um, in the arteries that can break off and, and actually travel and become clots. Watch for monitoring for bleeding and abdominal pain. Um, and it usually takes a few weeks for it to become uh, therapeutic. Your phosphate, phosphodiesterase inhibitors and antiplatelets. Um, Platel is a brand name. Usually it's going to be the first line for those who have intermediate claudication. A lot of times it's used in combination with a walking program. It is a vasodilator, so make sure that you don't give it with other vasodilators. Stantins can help with the manifestations that are associated with PAD. Again, with statins, remember um, one big thing is that you need to make sure um, that the patient doesn't have issues with their liver. So other things that can be done is a thrombolysis. So this is um, what can be done if there's a stenotic area to kind of help um, open up that area. They'll actually inject directly into the stenotic area. Patients typically have to be placed in the ICU for monitoring. And that kind of makes sense because if they're putting medication there, you're going to want to watch them for clots, um, breaking off, traveling, and just for overall hemodynamic monitoring. Surgical management for peripheral arterial disease. Um, sometimes they may feel there is too much plaque um, to go in and use like a, a balloon to compress the plaque. So depending on the severity of the blockage, they may do an arterial bigraph, uh, bypass graph, which is also known as revascularization, and that's typically going to be first line. So if you hear revascularization, think of bypass graft. If the claudication is severe um, and it can't be fixed again, amputation might also be needed. Um, priority in the end is to try to maintain circulation. Some endovascular interventions, uh, so for those individuals um, where they feel this might be successful, that the percentage of blockage isn't that bad, they can actually do an angioplasty or, or a percutaneous translumen balloon angioplasty, also called as P, uh, PTA. It can be done with or without a stent, so sometimes they might just go in and put a balloon and kind of blow it up and compress it. Um, a stent, they'll actually, it's kind of like a cage, they'll actually hold it. Um, complications, uh, again, you're always going to look for um, bleeding, hematoma, and, and damage to the lining here of the artery, which is also called the intima. So post-op care for bypass and um, endovascular treatments, patient needs to be in bed rest for four to six hours. Affected leg needs to be kept straight. Um, immediately after surgery, every 15 minutes up to an hour, then every 30 minutes um, for two hours, and then every four, every hour for four hours, you need to be checking their pedal pulse, the incision site, watch their output, and their pain levels. Um, again, this is super important. Um, you need to make sure that blood is getting um, to the foot. I mean, that's the whole purpose um, of this procedures. So if not, um, then you need to be contacting the surgeon. The patient will be on anti coagulants during the procedure, and then antiplatelets for one to three months. Complications that could occur, graph occlusion, um, any deterioration uh, that you see in the patient must be reported immediately, infection, and compartment syndrome. 
if you have a few moments, this is a very interesting um, video to watch. And it's talking about the difference between arterial and venous ulcers and wound care. So if you look at some of the difference you'll see um, in the complications of arterial versus venous. Here's venous. This is an arterial issue. So this is here, if you look, you know, remember venous issue is going to be more of an issue with blood return. Arterial is going to be actually blood getting to the extremity. And neuropathy is going to be when somebody can't actually feel and damage can occur. Um, whether it's stepping on a nail, piece of wood, something that goes and causes infection. Vascular ulcer management, if it's venous, um, typically they're going to uh, debride the neurotic tissue. Different types of debridement, um, sometimes they'll do surgical, um, wet to dry, and autolytic debridement um, using triad cream. If it's arterial, you want to keep it dry. Um, and neurotic tissue is a lot of times left alone until revascularization can be completed. Because again, um, if you're already having this necrotic tissue um, there, it kind of creates a barrier and you don't want to remove it until you're actually getting blood flow back to the extremity. And obviously, antibiotics when infected. Inflammatory disorders, so there's always going to be an inflammatory response that's going to help with granuloma fa um, formation and cause vessel destruction. A lot of times the initial treatment is going to be high doses of corticosteroids. Um, revascularization is going to be delayed if indicated until the inflammation is under control. And again, when you see this, um, make sure you're looking at the comorbidities of the patient because things like diabetes, if you remember, um, corticosteroids is going to inhibit um, the body's ability to uptake uh, insulin, um, allow insulin to do its job. So these patients are going to be at higher risk for um, hyperglycemia. So another um, arterial condition, uh, Raynaud's, is benign and it's self-limiting. They really don't know its etiology, um, but things they do know about it is that stress and cold seem to trigger it. So what happens here, um, this picture does a very good job explaining it. So the digital arteries are meant to supply blood to the fingers. So this is when you have normal blood flow. You see the digital arteries, and when stress or cold happens, um, there is constriction of the digital arteries that, that block blood flow to the fingertips, causing discolorization. So the blood flow becomes blocked because of the constricted digital arteries. And so you can see how the discoloration can occur. Another arterial condition is called Brigger's disease. It's a reoccurring inflammation of the intermediate and small arteries of the, ve of the vessels that particularly you see in the hands. It's thought to be um, a type of autoimmune vasculitis. It's usually seen in males ages 20 to 35. And again, um, here, tobacco is thought to be the causative agent. So that is basically a quick overview of vascular disease. Um, obviously focus on PAD, claudication, rest pain, and uh, I think he'll do just right. Or just, he'll do just fine. There we go. He will do just fine. <laughs> Take care. Bye-bye.